What's up good people? Welcome to another video. I'm Rob Stewart and I'm here to help you get your skin and your overall health back on track. Today we have a really great interview with Dr. Paul Saladino. Many of you guys know him as the Carnivore MD. He is the author of the amazing book Carnivore Code. He's also one of the leading educators for the carnivore movement. And many of you guys don't know this, but Dr. Paul Saladino used to have eczema and the carnivore diet has totally healed his skin. He talks a lot about that in today's video as well. Stay tuned. Um, if you're loving this content, make sure to like it, remember to share it, remember to hit the notification bell, remember to subscribe and share. Much love. One of the reasons why I am so excited to have uh, Dr. Paul Saladino on the show today is because there really aren't that many high profile people who are MDs and on the carnivore diet and who've suffered from skin disease themselves. Um, and you're that guy. So I'd love to start the conversation off today kind of in that realm where I'd love to hear about your path of diet, nutrition, and skin disease and how that led you to where you're currently at. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. That really is the center of my journey and how I got here. I've had eczema since I was a kid. I had asthma as a kid. Most listeners will know that the eczema and asthma continuum is called ATP or atopic dermatitis and is often coexistent. So I had an autoimmune disease. I have an autoimmune disease. We all, you know, many of us will have predispositions or have autoimmune diseases. So as a kid, I remember having like itchy bumps between my fingers and occasional rashes. And then as I got older, the rashes got to be worse to the point that it, a couple of times in my life, they were persistent over my whole body, something we call an id reaction. And they would be triggered seemingly at random times. In retrospect, I think that there, there has always been food triggers. But for most of my life and my medical education, once I got to be an adult and went to medical school and started thinking about illness and disease, the, these autoimmune diseases have been sort of the center of my preoccupation. I've been fascinated by understanding why the immune system reacts against us sometimes. And these skin conditions are some of the most obvious, the most overt autoimmunity. You can't necessarily look at someone and say they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis unless they have a goiter. But when somebody has psoriasis or eczema or some of these other skin diseases, you're, it's very clear there's something going on and it's very clear that the immune system is reacting to something in the skin or at least that's where it's manifesting. And I've always thought of them as some underlying chronic inflammation. And as I thought about this in medicine, I thought this is probably food, right? What is causing this? If you ask mainstream dermatology, they kind of throw their hands up as do mainstream rheumatologists with regard to other autoimmune diseases. You know, mainstream medicine doesn't really have a great idea what causes Sjogren's or scleroderma or uh, dermatomyositis or psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. They just kind of go, oh, it's bad genes. And that was never a satisfying explanation, explanation for me in any way, shape, or form. I thought there has to be a reason. There has to be a reason. You hear cases of this resolving. And so I actually started this journey before I went to medical school and I went on a vegan diet <laughs> because I'd heard stories of people being on vegan diets and I didn't just do vegan, I did raw vegan. Did it for seven months and I heard all these stories, oh, I resolved my ulcerative colitis or Crohn's with a vegan diet and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's not good for humans to eat meat. And again, this was before I had a whole lot of medical knowledge or a nutritional uh, wherewithal, but my results of the vegan diet were pretty abysmal. I had horrible gas, incredibly bad GI symptoms, uh, you know, farted all the time and lost 35 pounds of muscle weight, mate, muscle weight within seven months. And thought, this isn't good. So when I got so skinny that no girls would go well, out with me. You were doing it wrong, right? What's that? You're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, you're just not, you're doing a vegan diet wrong. I'm like, man, I'm about to die. I'm so skinny. And the problem was that I was a runner. And so Within the running community, I thought, oh, I want to be really skinny like these born runners, these Ethiopians or East African runners. And so I didn't really realize how much of a body dysmorphia was going on. A lot of my friends were super skinny. We all looked like runners. But when, it got, when I got so skinny that women did not want to date me because I was ridiculously skinny, I was like, there's something wrong. And I heard a podcast with Jeff Bland, who is one of the guys that was kind of the originators of functional medicine thinking about root cause illness. And he was talking about this genetic book of life. And I think he said something in there, you know, humans have always eaten meat. 
it's a crucial part of the human diet. I thought, ah, oh, that makes so much sense. Like, why am I not eating meat? So added meat back into my diet, gained weight back, and then stopped running 100 miles a week and now weigh 175 pounds. But you can imagine me, I mean, I'm not a big guy now. I'm muscular, but I'm not a big guy now. Mm -hmm. At 140 pounds, I was pretty skinny. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can, I can relate directly to that. My, my vegan journey went a lot longer, but I went from 190 down to 145. And now two years into carnivore, I hold on to 180 pretty darn easy. And you know, it's, it's quite striking. And I, I posted something about this on my Instagram and it got an insane amount of likes. If you just look at the body habitus, if you look at the way that vegan doctors look versus the way that doctors who support meat look, it's not even a question. Like you just cannot hold on to muscle mass on a vegan diet unless you are a vegan bodybuilder, probably using tons of synthetic protein powders and potentially Mexican supplements or steroids. So people will point to the vegan bodybuilders and say, vegan bodybuilders, we can hold muscle. Then, then why are all the vegan doctors I see having osteoporosis and breaking toes and, and looking completely sarcopenic? There's a real discordance here that people don't point out. But if you look, you know, I'm pretty muscular for somebody that doesn't actually bodybuild. And there's Sean Baker, who's muscular and other women MDs like Jamie Seaman. People who are pro meat clearly retain more muscle mass. It's not even a question. And, you know, if you really think about what we use our muscle for and how much of a survival advantage it is to have muscle on your body, then it's not even a question of which diet is helping us better. So I added meat back into my diet, gained some weight, felt better, stopped farting all the time. Um, but my eczema continued and I had a paleo diet, which was organic for probably the next eight to 10 years. And the eczema just persisted and persisted and persisted to the point that I was doing a lot of jujitsu and I would get eczema on my elbows and my knees. Sometimes it would get super infected and have impetigo. And I thought, what is going on? I'm eating this organic paleo diet consisting of lettuce and avocado and berries and, um, and meat and occasional other foods, but really not eating any gluten, not eating any dairy, not eating any junk food. And I still had bad eczema. So I kept cutting things out of my diet. And as you know, if you go down this rabbit hole in functional medicine, there's oxalates and lectins and histamines and all kinds of things and nightshades and all kinds of things people talk about triggering autoimmune disease. So I cut them all out and I still had eczema, right? So I'm on a low oxalate, low histamine, you know, low zero nightshade paleo diet and I still have bad eczema. And it was at that point that I heard about the carnivore diet. And my first response was, that's crazy. I had been thinking about functional medicine or had believed that a functional medicine paradigm was valuable. And within the functional medicine framework, which I now really don't believe to be complete, but within that framework, there's a lot of emphasis on plants and plant molecules, polyphenols and fiber as beneficial. So when I first heard about a carnivore diet, my original sort of thinking was that doesn't work for me. I had a lot of cognitive dissonance and my conditioning got in the way quite a bit. And, but my eczema wasn't getting better and I wanted to try it, so I dove in, and wouldn't you know it, within two to three weeks, eczema's gone. I've been doing a strictly carnivore diet for the last two years, and it's never recurred at all, whereas you know, every few months, I would have a pretty bad outbreak before. So clearly, there were plants in my diet that were triggering my autoimmunity. And as anyone listening to this will know, it's not just about itchy things on your skin that you can get rid of with a steroid cream. It's the idea that smoldering inflammation in my body is probably not a good thing because I'm going to see it in my skin, but it's probably going to be doing things elsewhere. I think of inflammation and this kind of chronic low level inflammation that accompanies autoimmunity like rust. Of course, this is just an analogy, but you know, it's like, I don't want that process causing damage to my endothelium of my gut or my blood vessels or anywhere. So I always wanted to get rid of it and to think, I just want things to be as quiet and as quiescent and calm in my body as possible. So because I had such improvements on a carnivore diet, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I felt better psychologically. I felt more positive. I felt more upbeat. And my gut symptoms went away. I had way less gas even from you know before when I had moderate amounts of gas on a paleo diet. But now I had like zero gas and I only farted like once a day. It was amazing. And it didn't smell. I was like, wow, this is so great for my social life. Like I never fart. My gut feels amazing. My poops are perfect. My eczema has gone. I'm more positive. This is amazing. I got to dig in. 
And that began sort of my journey into the research around how eating an animal-based diet could be sustainable, why so many of the things I'd been told with regard to plants were probably wrong and misleading, and that's where the book came out of it. So most of your listeners will know I wrote a book, The Carnivore Code. Hopefully you've seen it, and uh, yeah. I've seen it and read it. I, I think your book's uh, one of the better ones out there, and you know that was a perfect segue to um, kind of a topic that I like to talk about with all people who I call bioavailable eaters. Um, one is from kind of the plant-based world, you get a lot of mostly epidemiology studies um, that they use as the word of God. This is facts, here's the proof, now shut your mouth and eat more veggies. Here's my question to you, someone who's what I would call science-based, evidence-based, um, is there true scientific evidence out there that points to animal proteins either being inflammatory cancer causing or unhealthy period i've never seen an interventional study to suggest that and i highlight this in the book so much of the rhetoric that gets thrown around right now by plant-based advocates like you say is epidemiology and so though it's a dry topic I think on these podcasts, it's very important to highlight for people what epidemiology is and what interventional studies are and why they're so different. So technically, what we're referring to is observational epidemiology and interventional epidemiology, but colloquially, it's been referred to as epidemiology and interventional studies. Epidemiology are survey-based studies. There is no experiment. There's no control group. They'll take a group of people and they'll survey them to look for health conditions, how much heart disease, how much cancer, how much diabetes do you have? And they'll give them a, they'll either follow them moving forward or follow or do a survey based on their recall retrospectively and ask them what they ate. Now, at first glance, this sounds like, oh, that could be valuable. If people are eating way more hamburgers and they get way more diabetes, maybe hamburgers cause diabetes. But there's a big maybe in that statement. Epidemiology studies are only meant to generate hypotheses, which must then be tested with interventional studies. And so much of the plant-based propaganda and rhetoric is based upon the weight of the evidence, the weight of the evidence. And you can do a meta-analysis of epidemiology studies. Well, if you make a pile of garbage, it's still a pile of garbage. It's still a pile of observational studies with no experiment. And the reason observational studies like this can be so misleading is because just because somebody eats hamburgers and gets diabetes doesn't mean the hamburgers cause diabetes. Was it the milkshake they ate with the hamburger? Was it the French fries they ate with the hamburger? Was it the bread they ate with the hamburger? Was it the oxidized vegetable oils in the French fries that they ate with the hamburger? Was it the fact that we've been told for the last 70 years that meat is bad for us? So anyone that eats meat is a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to wear, you know, they're figuratively going to wear a leather jacket and ride motorcycles around. But, you know, realistically, they're more likely to smoke, more likely to drink, less likely to exercise, less likely to get in the sun, and less likely to do other health behaviors like go to the doctor regularly for checkups. So people that eat meat are more likely to eat junk food because we've been told that meat is junk food. So if you eat one type of junk food, you're going to eat all the types of junk food. Now, you and I agree that meat is not junk food, but Steak tastes good. And so it's not uncommon to eat steak with, you know, candy or steak with a milkshake or steak with a Coca-Cola. And epidemiology is absolutely powerless to divinate, to inter untwine which of those causal factors might be the actual thing that we're looking at here. Then enter interventional studies. This is a control group, a non-control group. You have one group where you do no intervention or you give a placebo, another group where you do intervention where you give them more meat. And there's a couple of really good studies like this that I talk about in the book. There have been studies in which they decrease the amount of carbohydrates in someone's diet. This is an interventional study and they increase the amount of red meat. In this study, it was eight ounces more per day. So half a pound more red meat per day, which is a pretty significant amount of red meat for most people. Mm -hmm. And they follow them longitudinally. So they're doing an experiment and they look four, six, eight, 12 weeks later, what do they find? insulin resistance gets better, diabetes gets better, inflammatory markers go down, DNA damage doesn't increase. So how anyone can say that meat is inflammatory 
is ludicrous and kind of beyond me because they're only looking at this misleading epidemiology. We have to be very careful. The other thing that's crazy about epidemiology is it's very easy to be cherry picked. You can't really cherry pick a, an interventional study because an interventional study stands on its own. But if you're looking at population-based observational studies, you can pull all the population-based observational studies that support your hypothesis and ignore all the ones that don't. And in the case of epidemiology, with regard to meat, this happens repeatedly. Mm -hmm. In the case of meat and cancer, there are epidemiology studies that will show that more meat consumption is associated, right? It's correlation, not causation, with higher rates of cancer in the West. But if you go to Asia, more meat consumption is associated with lower rates of cancer and lower rates of heart disease. How is that true? Does meat, is meat good for Asians and bad for Americans? That doesn't make any sense. That's a pretty big genetic variation. I don't think that's what's going on. It's that the narratives in the two places are so different that the narrative in Asia for the last 70 years has been that meat is the food of people who are affluent and successful. So who eats meat? People who are affluent and successful. So it totally changes the way your epidemiology study looks. This is the danger with epidemiology and why you can't rely on it. That's, I mean, that, that's really awesome. I also think that it is fair to say that I'm someone who I like to read research. I, I like to listen to other people's anecdotal stories, but it really does come down to what you were talking about earlier is how is this making me feel? What are my own inflammatory markers telling me? What is my lack of farts and bloating after I eat three and a half pounds of steak telling me as a human? Am I waking up every morning with a morning wood like a 14 year old or am I struggling to be even remotely sexually attracted to a woman who I think is the most beautiful thing in the world so for me it's been quite amazing to go from that vegan bloated and I was a trumpet booty gas machine myself um, to looking down after a meal and and seeing nothing happening and having no spikes in energy after eating and for me a huge one was sleeping all the way through the night without having to rush to the bathroom in the morning. So um, a question that I'd have for you is, I know you promote a lot of nose to tell eating, which is kind of a new concept for a lot of people who are just starting to get into the carnivore diet thing. I'd, I'd love to hear what that is from your experience, kind of how you eat and, and really what you'd suggest to kind of newbies that are looking to kind of make a transition to a more bioavailable food based system. Yeah. So I love that you said it that way. I think animal-based diets are very bioavailable. And what we're talking about with bioavailability is micronutrients. At a broad level, a lot of us are familiar with macronutrients, protein, fat, carbohydrates. But really, I think the magic of an animal-based diet is micronutrients. And this is something that um, we're not all as familiar with. We hear about some micronutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, but we don't often hear about things like thiamine or riboflavin or pyridoxine or folate or K2 or you know, carnitine or choline or carnosine or anserine. And all of these are little micronutrients that are more specific than the big macronutrient categories. And so if you look at what's in a steak, it's incredibly nutrient rich, but there are some of these micronutrients that are missing. And if you look at the way that indigenous peoples and our ancestors have always eaten animals and continue to eat animals, they eat the whole animal. Now, for a lot of people, this conjures up images of like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where he's eating like the monkey brains. And they're like, oh my God, I would never do that. And I don't think we need to eat monkey brains to eat nose to tail. But even for many of us, things like liver or heart are kind of squeamish and they think that's gross. And what I recommend to people is they just take a step back and think about how much their conditioning is limiting them. And if, if there were not unique nutrients in these foods, perhaps it would not be as important to consume them, but there are. And if you look at liver, for instance, it's a great source of folate and riboflavin and vitamin A and many other things like copper, which are particularly lacking in steak. And so in the people I work with on carnivore or carnivore-ish diets, when they are on steak only or steak and eggs, it's not uncommon to have folate deficiencies and lower levels of folate in the blood, in the red blood cells, leading to higher levels of homocysteine, et cetera. 
homocysteine being one of the products of the methylation cycle, the folate cycle, which requires bioactive folate to function and riboflavin to get that MTHFR enzyme working. So the picture really starts to get completed nutritionally when we eat the whole animal. And that challenges us in many ways to think, I've never eaten liver. How do I eat liver? Or what am I going to eat? What about kidney? Or what about heart? And et cetera. So it's just the idea that if you look at where the nutrients are distributed in animals, it's fascinating to realize that they're throughout the animal. They're not just in the muscle. They're in the muscle and the heart and the brain and the liver and the kidney and the spleen and the pancreas and the thymus and the bone marrow. And so we don't have to eat all of those organs all the time. But if we really want to be optimal, eating as many as we can is better. Now, there are lots of ways to do this. Um, I'm kind of a savage and a, just a crazy astronaut. I'll just eat them all raw. And I eat as many of the organs as I can raw every day. And I actually just filmed a video yesterday, what I eat in a day. And I had a cutting board, you know, the size of a pretty big size cutting board full of raw organs. And I think most people, if they saw that, would think that is absolutely disgusting. I've grown to like it. You can also cook the organs. You can grind the organ meat into burger patties. You can do things like pate. You can make things like liverwurst. There are ways to do this, or we can just kind of address the organs head on and just eat them either cooked or raw. Obviously, any raw food in terms of animals is going to present an increased risk of contamination. People should be careful with that. Um, as a physician, I have to always be uh, cognizant and uh, advising caution, but I have not had any problems with raw organs myself. The, the final option is the desiccated organ capsules, which are a great thing for people who need a, uh, a supplementary role. And this is low temperature dehydration that allows people to get the organs in a capsule. It's much easier or when we're traveling or we can't get it. But the, the ethos of nose to tail is eat the whole animal because there are unique nutrients throughout it. Some people might say, well, can't I just take a multivitamin? I don't think it's quite the same because there are all kinds of things in these organs that we don't even know about or are just beginning to learn about. Like I said, carnitine, choline, carnosine, taurine, anserine, things that are just really valuable, right? And nature has kind of already packaged them for us to, to try and reductionist think our way through it or to simplify it is probably going to lead to problems. There's other, there's also possibilities of growth factors, hormones, peptides in these organs. People are all excited right now about BPC-157. Well, that occurs naturally in the stomach and the intestines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's probably, there's TA1, which is thymus and alpha-1 in the thymus. And do these peptides survive digestion? Probably so. Are we, getting, are we getting signals to our body by eating these organs beyond what is actually in them on a micronutrient level? That's the part that's most fascinating to me. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's super fascinating. And a question that pops up while you're talking about eating raw liver um, is a question that I get from the people I work with on a regular basis is, okay, I've tried liver and I've had it fresh and it tastes like, whoa, the most delicious meat candy ever. But I've also had liver that it, it just kind of doesn't taste that great. How do you source your things like liver and, and the other kind of taboo foods um, to really assure high quality and to kind of get that that freshness and that taste that, that can be so different. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think the organ meats, just as much as meat, anyone who's listening to this that is, that is eating a lot of steaks will know that sometimes you eat a steak and you're like, that is amazing. What did that cow eat? That cow probably ate grass, had a really green grass for its whole life. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of farms that I've tried to develop relationships with and tell my audience about places like Belcampo, White Oak Pastures, Buy Ranch Direct, um, all these farms throughout the country, U.S. Wellness Meats is another one. Um, some of their stuff is from Australia, but it seems to be pretty good. And you just want to get the best meat you can. Most people listening to this, the easiest thing would be to find a farmer near you, go to the field, see the cow, see what it looks like, and then figure out, you know, taste the organs. But it has to do with freshness and quality and what the cow eats. I'll tell you the organs that I get are almost entirely from white oak pastures. And they're fantastic. I mean, their liver is amazing. And I know those cows. I've been to that farm and it's an amazing regenerative farm in Georgia doing things with rotational grazing. Um, this is a fascinating way of raising cattle now whereby you can move them around different pastures 
And uh, they always get sort of this green grass. It's Georgia, so they get lots of rain. The soil is dark. And by moving them around pastures, they increase the soil quality, the organic matter in the soil, and the life cycle analyses suggest that that type of farming is carbon negative if people are concerned about the balance of carbon emissions and how we're thinking about the atmosphere. But what I know is that the meat from those farms tastes amazing and the organs are some of the best I've ever had. So quality matters. Just seek out those sources online. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's, that's really wonderful advice. I'm, I'm curious, and I know that the listeners and the people who are going to be watching this, um, it's a basic question, but I think we can extrapolate so much information from watching other people who are having the success that we want. And I'm curious what a typical day of eating looks like for you. Do you throw in some intermittent fasting? When do you start your meals? Just kind of how the whole thing goes down and what you eat. Yeah, it's pretty consistent. Like I said, I made that video yesterday. I'll hopefully post it in the next couple of weeks for people on my YouTube channel or talk about it on my website, which is carnivoremd.com. But I get up in the morning and I will have like a glass of water, do a little meditation, do some grounding. And then, you know, mid morning, I think this morning it was about 9 a.m. I'll usually eat breakfast and I like to eat breakfast and a late lunch and then not eat dinner. So I will do intermittent fasting and I'll eat twice a day. A carnivore diet is very filling. I don't find that I need to snack between meals. In fact, snacks are like a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I eat. And some of it may even be surprising for people because I've been experimenting with both ketogenic and carbohydrate carnivore diets. And I'm talking about this more in the cookbook, which I'm releasing in the fall. Awesome. But um, for about a year and a half, I did strict ketogenic carnivore, which is low carb carnivore. And over the last few months, I've been incorporating carbohydrates to see how I feel. And I actually have a continuous glucose monitor on right now, which I've been recording my blood glucose with the carbs. So right now, I'll get up in the morning and I'll do those things, then I'll eat. And I eat about a pound and three quarters of meat per day. In the book, I talk about these ratios, the ballpark. What seems to work for people is about one gram of protein per pound of goal weight. And if I am eating zero carb, I will then do one gram of fat per gram of protein. I think a lot of people run into problems on a carnivore diet because they have too much protein, not enough fat, that can lead to constipation or other issues. So if you're gonna do zero carb carnivore, you wanna make sure to do enough fat and you can add things like suet or trimmings or other fats from the animal, bone marrow, egg yolks to get the extra fat, but that's crucial on a zero carb diet. So what I'll do right now, in the morning I'll have about a little more than three quarters of a pound, a pound of meat, it's grass fed, it's grass finished, I'll just pan sear it and eat it with salt. Depending on how lean the meat is, I may add a little extra fat. I am doing honey in my diet right now with two meals a day. I do about 50 grams of carbohydrates, which is three to four tablespoons of honey uh, with breakfast and at lunch. And it's just an experiment. And I'll tell you my blood glucose is actually pretty fascinating right now. My morning blood glucose is between 70 and 85 most days now. And it pretty much hangs out between 70 and 90 all day. When I eat a meal with 60 grams of carbohydrates from honey, which is almost pure sugar, uh, my blood glucose will spike about 25 to 30 milligrams per deciliter, go up to about 120, 115. And then within 20 to 30 minutes, it's back down. So it's a spike and back down. We talk about this in the book as well with regard to postprandial glucose levels. That type of a glucose behavior I don't think is dangerous. I want to experiment with a few more carbs as well. Some of the less toxic plant-based carbohydrates that I talk in the book, things like squash or maybe purple potatoes, we'll see, just to see if there's a different glucose response. But the postprandial glucose response that we want to be aware of is something that's 40 to 50 plus milligrams per deciliter. You're really only going to know this if you have a continuous glucose monitor and it lasts for a long time. The blood glucose will stay elevated for an hour or two hours that's what you don't want is postprandial hyperglycemia that's persistent. But a little spike like I'm getting is probably not a big issue. So it's interesting that my blood sugar doesn't spike that much and it doesn't spike for that long, even with the sugars. So I will do a pound of meat. I'll do about 50 to 60 grams of carbs with the honey. And then I'll do a little bit of fat, perhaps. I'm doing Redmond sea salt with all this. I like that salt. And I, then I will do organs. And in the morning, I mean, I have a variety of organs that I eat every day. Yesterday, I ate pretty much the full gamut. I ate testicle, spleen, thymus, kidney, pancreas, liver, and um, 
uh, probably one or two more heart. And so I'll try and eat as many as I can every day. I eat them raw, you can cook them. I'll eat a few ounces of each per day. And then I'll eat bone broth as well. I make my own bone broth and I'll put bones in the bone broth to make it gelatinous. And I'll put kind of the cartilaginous tissue in there to make it gelatinous. And then once the bones come out of the bone broth, they're soft. And I will use that as a calcium source. And you can actually chew on the soft bone. I've gotten very interested in calcium sources on a carnivore diet. I feel like that's one of the better ones. So that's pretty much my prototypical meal. And I'll repeat that twice a day and that's it. And a lot of people hear this. If people are, are hip to carnivore, they'll say, oh, that sounds great. Or maybe those organs are crazy. But when people hear about this generally, they also think, don't you get bored? I'd love to hear your perspective on this too. But one of the things I've found, which is quite surprising, and I've corroborated this kind of on surveys on Twitter and stuff, is that I don't really get bored eating animal foods. I, I really look forward to steak every single meal. People don't have to mirror my diet. I give lots of different dietary possibilities in the carnivore code. You can eat other meats as well if you want to mix it up. I have just found grass-fed, grass-finished beef or buffalo to be the most satisfying meat. If I'm provided with chicken or duck, I'll eat it, but it's not as good in my opinion. Turkey is also fine. People can do seafood, but I would be aware of heavy metal contamination. So that's pretty much how I do it. And I'll do twice a day. I'll end my eating with a pretty decent uh, amount of time between that and when I'm gonna go to sleep, I like to eat earlier in the day. I don't like to eat late. So I will end up doing intermittent fasting just kind of as an adjunct. I think my eating window today, I'll probably eat dinner around uh, four o'clock. So I'll start eating at about nine, I'll finish at four or four thirty. It's about seven, seven and a half hour eating window. Yeah, that's that's excellent. And to kind of answer your question, the getting bored with my diet. That has never been an issue in the two years I've been doing this. And I, I eat a somewhat varied carnivore style diet. Um, I will have a little bit of seafood like you if I have, you know, duck or chicken or something in front of me. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, tear it up and enjoy it. A lot of beef, a lot of bison. Um, and I've also kind of in coordination um, done a very similar thing playing with my carbohydrate intake. For the first probably year, I was pretty strict keto with my carnivore foods. And then just as I'm, I love to experiment and I like to see, you know, where you can wiggle and what different things will do. And I've, I've done the same thing, adding some honey and then adding a few of what I call the low risk trigger foods from the plant kingdom that I've previously established for myself as working. And I, I've seen it changed the way I feel slightly on the carnivore diet, but more so in a way of performance and aesthetics. So for me, um, both are super easy to maintain. They taste delicious. I never really get bored because the satiation level, and I, I just think when your body is so filled up with the right nutrients, your cravings kind of cease to exist. Yeah. Um, when I was vegan, it was, eat a ton of food and always have cravings and always, always hungry. Um, and, and that's not the case anymore at all. But what I've noticed with a really fat based and ketogenic style carnivore diet is it is extremely easy to stay very shredded and very lean while holding on to a good amount of muscle. Um, you really don't lose the muscle at all. Cognitively, hormonally feels really good, really awesome, really consistent. What the carbs have done for me is it gives me that little extra explosiveness in my workouts. I'm a former athlete, and when I'm on a ketogenic style, um, there is no lack, but when I add the right amount of carbs for myself from smart sources, the lifts and the workouts have a little extra juice for me personally. Also, I think that if people are kind of in that place where beef and salt only as a dietary intervention for healing is they can't do it. You'd be really surprised what adding a very small amount of honey to that diet will do to your taste buds. Um, so I've had a, a, a similar kind of results and experience that, that you have with that. That's fascinating. Yeah. And that's been my experience with carbohydrates too. It's, I don't have objective measures, you know, I don't really lift that heavy. I'll deadlift and squat, but I'm never like lift. I'm not like a power lifter. 
right? So it's been hard for me to kind of distinguish. I, I do think perhaps with the carbs, I feel a little better in the gym. I think I probably weigh a few pounds more, which is Same. fascinating, like two to three pounds, probably muscle glycogen. And I've talked about this in the past. There have been studies with keto adapted athletes. And I mean, I was very keto adapted, suggesting that the amount of muscle glycogen and repletion is equivalent between carbs and no carbs. But I probably gain a few pounds of water weight when I do carbs, suggesting that maybe my glycogen stores are a little higher. That could all just be liver glycogen mm -hmm. because certainly when we eat carbs, we're going to fill up the liver glycogen. When we don't eat carbs, what appears to happen is we still have muscle glycogen, but maybe that's just the liver weighing a few more pounds, which is quite possible from the liver glycogen. But I do think that perhaps there's a little bit of a difference for me with carbs. And like I said, I've got a cookbook coming out in the fall and I want to offer both versions to people and let them know, and then also expand in the cookbook on the spectrum of plant toxicity. I'd be curious to see what carbs you've used from the plant kingdom, but I do think that plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity, and there probably are some plants that most people can eat. It's not the plants that we think of as traditionally healthy. I, I sort of joke that I'm like the anti-broccoli crusader, and I was just on another podcast. I'm on that squad too. Right? Like I was just on another podcast with a doctor who's all about leafy greens, and I was like, no, we're going to agree to disagree. I think leafy greens are the worst thing to happen to humans. Um, but you and I, like, we're in the 0.1% of people who believe that. Right. But I do think that perhaps for some people, things like squash, I'm fascinated by the non-sweet fruits, things like squash, avocado, maybe berries. I think those could be good sources of carbohydrates for people. I even think something like uh, a purple potato could possibly be, I think when we get into the tubers, there's probably a few more things that could be issues for people. Personally, what I found was that honey is the best for me right now. I tried squash and my eczema came back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I was like, huh, that's interesting. I would be surprised. You know, people have talked about lectins in squash. Perhaps that's it. It just doesn't agree with me. But I want people to know that you can incorporate carbohydrates in your diet without having any plant products. Honey is kind of this magical thing. Right. Uh, totally ancestral. But if you want to have some plant products, and I love that you highlighted this, I think for people who find a carnivore diet or a strict carnivore diet limiting, even having a small amount of plant products can be the difference. For most people I talk to, they're like, I don't think I could eat all meat. And I say, what if you could eat meat and berries and avocado and squash? They say, I think I could do that. I think a lot of people already do a diet or pretty close to that. They're just trying to eat broccoli in addition because I think it's beneficial. So for me, that might be the sweet spot. That's kind of what I consider to be a tier one carnivore diet in the book or a carnivore-ish diet. And I think yeah. that's, you know, you're animal based and you're thinking about which plant foods are the least toxic. Yeah, totally. I think, I think for me, through my experimentation so far, what actually works really good is squash does seem to work really good for me. I don't eat it in large amounts at all. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty minimal when I, when I do eat it. Um, the other plant foods that work for me are the low glycemic fruits you know, simple, basic stuff like some berries, like some pears. Um, those seem to be totally fine for me. And I work exclusively with the eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis community. And I have found there to be some truths to that can kind of ring true for everyone. But also, there is a pretty huge individualization within uh, eating food for people like us. And what I found like, you know, for you to squash that made your, made your eczema come back. For me, I can get away with some squash. I can even get away with some regular potatoes. But I also think that really the whole journey is about being honest with yourself and your results and, and not being too afraid to try something out. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Don't eat it. Try something else. Um, I love, I love how in your new book, you're going to kind of give a nice variety of carnivore-ish style eating. Um, and I think that food is the most amazing intervention for people who suffer from skin disease, bar none. But Huge. it's not the whole game. It's not everything. You know, there are other aspects to healing and being healthy um, that are out there. And I've seen, you know, a lot of your videos and your Instagram, and I know that you are someone who moves your body a lot. I know you get out in the sun. I also know that you address the nervous system directly with things like breath work, meditation, and cold exposure. And I'd love to hear about some of the other facets of how you stay on your game in a holistic way. Yeah, so you think 
about this all. And I, I kind of talk about this at the end of the carnivore code. So in my first book, I do offer a spectrum of plant toxicity. I want people to know that. And in the cookbook, I'm going to expand on that quite a bit. And at the end of the carnivore code, which is my first book, I talk about this idea that we're, it's an ancestral way of living. We're really just, that's what everybody's trying to do, or a lot of people are trying to do, whether you're in the paleo community or whatever. We're trying to say like, how do we live in a way that's most consistent with our ancestors? And that goes way beyond food. So thank you for this question. And I think it's the next thing is sun. And I'm such a big proponent of real sunlight rather than processed sunlight in the form of a vitamin D pill. I just, I cannot be convinced that those are equivalent. And many people will say, well, I live in Nebraska, like where you're at right now, or mm -hmm. I live somewhere where there's no sun. And I think like, well, there's other ways to get sun. But for those of us who have access to the sun, at least in the summer, we should be in it and we should not fear the damage or we should not fear that the sun will do damage to our skin. Certainly if we are fair skin, that means we are efficient sun harvesters and we may need to use sunscreen if we're out at a uh, lower latitude for longer amounts of time, but be careful with the type of sunscreen you're using because some of them are gonna have plenty of xenoestrogens in them. So I'm Mediterranean. When I go out in the sun, I don't need sunscreen at like this latitude of San Diego. If I go to Hawaii, I'm probably gonna need some sunscreen unless I have a really good base tan. And there are plenty of sunscreens that are zinc based that don't have these bad additives. But all of us will probably need sunscreen if we go like really equatorial in the summer. I think that uh, there's so much of a fascinating conversation around this with how the mm, fatty acid composition of our cell membranes affects the way that our skin reacts to the sun. I think anyone in the eczema psoriasis dermatitis community is going to be aware of this too. You hear people say this, and it's only really started to kind of coalesce for me. On ketogenic and carnivore diets, people will anecdotally note that they get burned less often. And I think it's probably because we're eating less vegetable oils. And I think that these polyunsaturated vegetable oils, which are already oxidized or susceptible to oxidation, are the main problem with skin issues, skin cancers, and burning of the skin. When we eat more saturated fat, which I strongly believe is healthy for all humans, we're still going to eat some monounsaturated fat and a very small amount of PUFA polyunsaturated fat, but this ratio between poly, mono, and saturated, I think is something that we all have to get right to get adequate skin health in the sun, super important. And I think that so much of what we might be seeing regarding the incidence of skin cancers in people in the sun, specifically squamous and basal, is related to overconsumption of vegetable oils at large by our population, which is something that we all know happens widely. Interestingly enough, melanoma incidence is lower in people who have chronic low-level sun exposure, and melanoma is really not felt to be an exclusively sun-based cancer. Squamous and basal, yes, and I think that that is more of the vegetable oil thing, but melanoma is the one most people worry about. They're all concerning, but I think it's a big problem with the oils in our diet and how they react. So I encourage people to get out into real sun, not processed sunlight, like a vitamin D pill, because there are other things just like there are parts of the organs that we don't really even know about that are probably beneficial for us, I think there are many things that happen when we are in the sun that are so beneficial that we can't even be aware of now. We know that there's endorphins, there's um, all kinds of things that happen in the skin, there's nitric oxide in the sun. We don't get that from taking a vitamin D pill. So right. real sunlight, no substitute for that in my opinion both for circadian rhythm and for all these other good things in our human body, way beyond vitamin D. And then of course, movement, we know we need to move. I think grounding feels good for everyone. A lot of us can't even touch the earth anymore, but it feels you have to do that. And then cold exposure and heat, these are environmental hormetics. I talk about the difference between molecular hormesis and environmental hormesis in my book, which is a nuanced discussion. But I think the environmental hormetics, sauna, cold, are very valuable for all humans, as is community and doing something we love. So there's so much of the equation outside of food, which we need, right? We have to do something we love. We have to be with people we care about. We have to be outside and be moving. Well, in 2020, those are like foreign concepts to us, right? Both because of coronavirus and because of many other things. But I think that there's so much of a discussion here that needs to be had. I mean, evolutionarily, those would have been the things that were the foundation of our life. We would have lived outside, we would have touched the earth all the time. We would have been moving when we hunted. We would have been cold. We would have been warm and we would have been in the sun. 
And now we've just become, as Chris Ryan would say, civilized to death in many ways. So crazy Completely. stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful analysis of that. And I, I couldn't agree more. My experience, I'm obviously a pretty gingery type of guy, red hair, freckles. And I noticed a complete and obvious difference in the way that my body responded to the sun as I started eating in a, specifically egg yolks. When I have a few egg yolks every day, especially when I eat them raw and I go out into the sun, there's something about the, probably the cholesterol that's in them and the vitamin D, the real vitamin D, it creates something in my body without trying to sound woo woo or full of crap. I can feel something, it feels good, it feels like I've taken something, there's energy there, um, there's hormones happening, it lifts my spirit, um, and, and I, I can firsthand totally agree with when the fats and the, the ratios are on point and I have some good amount of cholesterol in me from the right sources, the sun is, is magical. Also, I think there's kind of um, a fallout mechanism. If you're going outside to get real sun, you're outside. You're breathing in good air. You're around green trees. You're around the ocean. You're out in the environment that provides the human being with the human experience that we all kind of lack. Yeah. And I think that is so nurturing and nourishing. I'm curious, I, I wanna, I know you don't have too much more time, but I'd love to hit on, you know, maybe two more topics that I think are super important. Um, one, I'd love to hear your advice for people during this crazy time with the coronavirus. Um, just ways to stay safe, your kind of idea, we were chatting a little bit before the video about your outlook on what's going on and, and what may be happening. And also some straight up fat sources. That's where people kind of fall short a lot of times with the carnivore diet is, you know, where can I get more fat rather than just eating steak or lean protein all the time? Yeah, yeah. So coronavirus is on everybody's mind now and I'm glad to be able to comment on it. My heart goes out to everyone who has been affected, who's suffering with it, who knows anyone that's been suffering from it. And I think that we're, I've been talking about this on social media the last few days and really struggling to make sense of it and offer something of value in the conversation. It's a challenging, it's a challenging place to be right now. I think that what we know is that, or what appears to be very true is that people with comorbidities are sadly much more susceptible to coronavirus. And though we all may know people in our lives who are more susceptible the fact remains that it, it does seem to have a predilection for those with insulin resistance, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, which are all part of the same continuum. And we shouldn't be surprised because we know that those people have immunologic uh, weakness. And again, I'm very sensitive to the fact that many people listening to this may know people in their lives who are like that. And as humans, as a society, I think we need to understand who is at most risk for illness with this in order to be able to move forward. Because I fear, on the other hand, I fear that we can't keep doing what we are doing. We can't social distance forever. The coronavirus is not going to go away. Um, I think that the current social distancing measures are probably helpful in that they prevent the overwhelm of the hospital capacity. But ultimately, when we stop the social distancing, coronavirus will still be here. And the way that this virus is going to be dealt with is that enough of us are going to get exposed and develop immunity that it can't spread. So this is the herd immunity concept, which I think is the way that humans have always dealt with this type of thing. Now, many of us are in cities which are much higher density, which make this kind of thing quite crazy. And it's just the fact that everyone gets sick all at the same time and there's no ability to develop herd immunity. When we're living in more disparate groups, uh, then eventually some people get exposed. They're not carriers, they're immune, and the virus is, can't hang out there, so they're not an adequate host, so they don't spread it as much. So that's, I think, where we're gonna have to get. Let me be a little more clear about that. I think that the virus will abate when 50 to 60% of the population has been exposed, and that may be a scary number for people to hear, if they are thinking about this with a fear-based mentality or buying into the media reports that we are all going to die from this. I, I am not convinced that this is a super virus that is going to wipe out our civilization. It's more virulent. It appears to be more virulent than a seasonal flu, but we don't know by how much just yet. And 
Um, it may be five times more virulent, it may be three to four times more virulent, but it's not something that's going to wipe out the population. And for me, the conversation becomes, how do we get the most robust immune system possible? How do we become you know, the strongest warrior <laughs> so that when we are not as worried about these sort of immunologic insults, there will always be people in our society, sadly, with disease. But what we know in this whole conversation has been about how we can become robust in the face of these challenges and how, we can, how nutrition affects immunology, immune system. This is the conversation that needs to be had right now. How do we have a strong immune system? Because I really believe that the way we're going to get through this is for more of us to be exposed rather than to hide. Now, those who are immunocompromised, those who are susceptible should be very careful and should be the ones who are, we are thinking about the most with regard to uh, how to help them become healthier. And they certainly may suffer and that's, that's something we want to avoid. But for those of us that are healthy, I think it's a very challenging time right now. Perhaps the most controversial aspect of the coronavirus discussion is the economic implications and now the societal and social implications of it. And I don't think we know how to go here. I think that what we're seeing now with unemployment numbers is staggering. And I don't think anyone is trying to trade unemployment for the loss of more life of our loved ones. But I think we can't ignore the economic implications of what we're doing now. And I suspect that very soon that will become crippling to our society. So it's a very delicate line to walk. And um, if, if I were pressed in terms of how we might solve the crisis right now, my suggestion, which is just not, I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not an infectious disease expert, but I am a doctor. My suggestion would be that, that those of us that are healthy actually get back into the population, probably that we wear masks and that we're careful and that we isolate those who are most susceptible, but that we don't continue to kind of cloister in this pseudo way that we either have to shut everything down and no one actually ever leaves their house or we allow those who will probably develop immunity to this virus to actually be exposed to the virus as we would a cold or a flu and to move forward from there. That's going to be a very controversial stance, but again, it comes from a place of me trying to understand how we move forward with the least amount of total human suffering and what's best for everyone because I don't think that we can continue doing what we are doing. Um, and with regard to, in a, you know, sort of an abrupt segue. <laughs> that's, that's, well, that's well said, you know, I, just to throw my own two cents in there. Yeah. I, I, and, and this is, again, I'm nowhere close to a doctor, um, but I, I do think there's kind of two things just to, to, to let people be aware of. One is that for most of us, if you do get it, you're not gonna die. So that's good news. Secondly, I think there's been a ton of people who have probably already had it and are symptom free and have overcome it and they might not even known it themselves. So um, I'm gonna leave it there. It, it is a very controversial and obviously it's on all of our minds. We both wish everyone out there safety and health and, and to do their best. Um, but the last question, the almighty fats, fat sources. And, you know, probably if we're going to talk about fats and eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, I think it's fair to talk about things like butter and ghee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I generally, in my own life, I have found that dairy of all sorts is immunologically triggering for me and I avoid it. Um, even when I've tried A2 dairy, which is a different isoform of casein that I talk about in the book, uh, even when I tried raw milk, even when I tried raw goat's milk, it still seems to trigger my immunologic susceptibility. So I think for some people, they need to realize that butter and ghee could still be an immunologic trigger. And what we're doing is trying to eliminate those things. So without butter and ghee, where do we get fat? And I think that we need to make friends with butchers and get trimmings, um, get things like suet and get things um, like egg yolks and bone marrow. And these are where our ancestors would have gotten fat from. We're just not familiar with it, nor do we seek it out. Again, I think that when you are doing a ketogenic carnivore diet, the fat sources are more important. Um, to be fair, <clears throat> I think that there are also vegetable sources of fat that are not as bad as others. Uh, coconut or olive would probably be better. Obviously, an avocado is a reasonable source of fat. I would say that 
I believe for many people, coconut could be triggering um, because of the salicylates and that animal fats are better than vegetable fats in general. I think vegetable oils beyond coconut and olive and perhaps avocado would be in, invariably off the table. Peanut, corn, soy, soybean. These are a big problem. We do not want these things. Canola oil, these are horrible ideas. And I would favor animal fats. If you want to do a rendered animal fat, you could do something like tallow. But those would be my recommendations for animal fat. And again, it's, it's, there is fat on the animal. We just don't see it because it's trimmed off by the butcher. So you have to kind of seek it out. And intriguingly, you know, the larger the animal, the more the fat. So if you're eating a deer that you hunted, there's not going to be any fat on that. And your ancestors would not have had enough fat on that to live. But if you're eating a buffalo or a cow, there's a decent amount of fat on a buffalo or a cow for a human to live on. That's where we should be getting it. When you are doing a carbohydrate, including carnivore diet, I don't think you will need as much fat and you can decrease it. Yeah, I think, I think that's such great advice. I think that's really good information. I love that you kind of give multiple variables. Not everyone is going to respond perfectly to a ketogenic style carnivore diet. Not everyone will respond well to adding a few plant foods or honey and carbohydrates to their, their carnivore style diet. I think you got to experiment. Um, in closing, um, both I want to give you a chance to let people know where to find you, your websites, your information, and if there's anything you want to close with, I, I'd love to open the floor up to you and speaking directly to, you know, the, the eczema and dermatitis psoriasis community. Cool. Yeah, thank you. You can find my book at thecarnivorecodebook.com. It's on Amazon. It's already a bestseller. It's been super fun to write and I'm just excited for more people to read it and let me know what you think. My website is carnivoremd.com. All my socials are carnivoremd. I've got a podcast of my own called Fundamental Health if you want to hear me talking to other people about this stuff. And it's but, good too. I've, I've, watched, I've heard a lot of the episodes. It's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's really fun to do it. And I think it's, you know, it's cool. I think this is probably one of the first podcasts I've done directly uh, targeted toward people with skin issues and having had them myself, I feel for everyone here. And I think the message would just be that I believe these are fixable. And I believe that if you don't have an answer that you keep looking and if, if you make dietary change and, and you don't see an answer, then keep looking. Maybe it's something in your gut. A lot of people I work with have significant improvement with a carnivore diet. And then you can add some plants back and see if they trigger you. Um, you can think about a spectrum of plant toxicity, or you can stay full carnivore. And then for people that have not had improvements, usually it's other things. There's something in their gut or some other allergen or something in their water. And, but usually I, I really believe these are um, fixable. And it's funny because I really like dermatology and I almost went into dermatology after medical school. Part of me wishes I had because the illnesses are so visible. We can see what's going on. You can track it so easily. It's, it's sadly debilitating or at least very um, impactful when we have it, uh, the illness, when we have the manifestations. And conversely, it's also so incredible and so noticeable when it goes away. So I think it's a great, it's a great model system for us to study with regard to the impact of diet on these things. So people who are listening just know that don't, don't give up. Uh, and I have a number of clients. In fact, I have two twin brothers who had like head to toe eczema. 95% better with a carnivore diet within the first few weeks. Wonderful. Awesome. So Dr. Paul Saladino, thank you so much for coming on the show. Lots of nuggets here um, for pretty much anyone looking to up their health game. Thanks for coming on um, and best of luck to you in this crazy time. My pleasure, man. Stay healthy, brother. I will. Have a good one.